All right. Um, welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, thank you all in the audience for being there. Um, uh, I also wish to thank uh, uh, Molly Davis from IDSVA who helped with the organization of this webinar. Uh, my name is Simonetta Moro. Uh, I am the director of the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, uh, where I am a professor of art, philosophy, and visual studies, and the editor of this volume, uh, the Vatimo Dictionary. Here it is. Uh, published by Edinburgh University Press in April 2023, 20, uh, so very recently. I wish to thank my colleagues and guest speakers here today, um, Silvia Mazzini, David Webb, and Santiago Zabala, for their contribution to the dictionary and for participating in this conversation. So uh, a few technical details, we'll speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll open the session to Q&A. Uh, please write your questions in the chat box designated as uh, Q&A and I'll do my best to address the questions um, with the help of my colleagues here. I very much look forward to this exchange uh, here today with uh, these three contributors to the Vatimo Dictionary of which I will give you a brief biographical introduction. Uh, I start with Silvia Mazzini, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Art Theory at the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. Uh, she has published on art politics and art and politics in Vattimo, Bloch and Pasolini, on tragic and comic thought and community theater. Currently, she's writing on the philosophy of poverty. Uh, among her publication, I will mention um, to eine menningfaltige mögliche Welt, Kunst und Politik by Ernst Bloch und Gianni Vattimo, and as co-editor, uh, Making Communism Hermeneutical on Vattimo and Zabala. Uh, David Webb is a professor of philosophy at Staffordshire University. He's the author of Heidegger Ethics and the Practice of Ontology and uh, Foucault's Archaeology, Science and Transformation and has also published on the work of Gaston Bachelard and Michel Serre. He also translated many books by Gianni Vattimo, um, such as The Transparent Society, uh, Beyond Interpretation, The Meaning of Hermeneutics for Philosophy, and co-translated Belief and Religion. Professor uh, Santiago Zabala is ICREA Research Professor of Philosophy at the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. He's the author of many books, including uh, Being at Large, uh, Freedom in the Age of Alternative Facts, and Why Only Art Can Save Us, Aesthetics and the Absence of Emergency. His opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, Al Jazeera, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among other international media outlets. So uh, thank you again for being here. I will start with uh, some general remarks about this project, the, <clears throat> the Vatimo Dictionary. And I will begin with uh, a key term, uh, conversation. Um, it's a term that Gianni Vatimo was particularly fond of. Uh, Santiago Zabala put it at the center of his obituary on the Los Angeles Review of Books um, of it, the Italian philosopher Gianni Vattimo, who passed away last September at the age of 87. It was part of Vattimo's particular way of thinking philosophy and the exchange of ideas, and it is very significant that this editorial project, the Vattimo Dictionary, began with a series of conversations, uh, precisely with Santiago in various locations, uh, physical and virtual, including the Vattimo archives, which are hosted at the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, where the first international presentation of this volume took place in, uh, on November 7th of this year, um, in the context of a commemoration of the philosopher, um, organized by Professor Zabala, who is also the supervisor of the archives. And um, I would like to begin with saying a word about the cover image, which, uh, is often uh, an unremarked aspect of books. So here I will hope you can see it um, without me sharing the screen, which seems to be a bit complicated. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> for me, being a visual artist myself, the cover of books is, is an important part of any publications. And 
Um, this one is particularly meaningful. It reproduces an artwork by the artist Giulio Paolini, a contemporary <clears throat> of Battimo and a friend of his. Uh, they both lived in Turin, uh, Paolini still does, where uh, the Paolini Foundation is located. Um, they also belong to the same generation. Uh, Vatimo himself was an estimator of Paolini's work, uh, which he collected. And the artwork in question is part of a series titled after the essay, um, Art and Space by Martin Heidegger. Uh, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century and, and a key thinker for Vatimo, as we will hear uh, later on. <clears throat> so um, I thought it was a particularly apt image for this book, and I, I wish to thank the Giulio and Anna Paolini Foundation and also the gallery Studio La Città for the rights to publish the image. The uh, Vatimo Dictionary is a project that uh, I immediately tackle with enthusiasm because it would have given me the opportunity uh, to participate in the dissemination of Vatimus thought among an increasingly larger English speaking public and to do so with the contribution of many scholars of Vatimus philosophy, um, which has been for me personally, a very enriching experience. Um, I hope some of them uh, are here in the audience and uh, I certainly invite, uh, invite the contributors to contribute to the discussion later on. I would also like to note that among all the philosophical dictionaries published by EUP, <clears throat> none has such a high number of authors. Uh, and the fact that 53 scholars have written entries on Vatimo, uh, the entries are 101, uh, but there could have been more. It's not just a number, uh, but it's indicative of how much um, Vatimo's thought is articulated and present in the most diverse fields of knowledge. And in fact, the entries that make up this dictionary reflect the scope of his thought in fields ranging from hermeneutics to ontology, uh, from art and aesthetics to religion and theology, from politics to a particular ontology of actuality he developed. So it is truly a very vast field that the dictionary represents. Um, and in this sense, uh, it provides a truly essential introduction in English to the philosophical thought of Gianni Vattimo, um, who, as you heard, is considered the most important Italian philosopher of the last 50 years, uh, and one of Hu Europe's foremost contemporary thinkers. Um, <clears throat> I also like to think of uh, the term essential, um, also in the sense of a succinct and accessible orientation into the meanders and ramification of Vatimbo's thought, um, a toolbox to enable the reader to find the references in relation to keywords uh, that inform his work and, and give the reader a chance to deepen their knowledge of a particular concept, author or thematical approach uh, in Vatimbo's literature. Um, I'll give you a few examples. In the volume, there are keywords that are directly related to concepts in his work, but there are also terms like analytic and continental philosophy, which situate his thought vis-a-vis uh, -vis the debate around these two traditional branches in Western philosophy. Um, I would also mention Gifford Lectures, uh, written by Santiago Zabala, which gives a measure of the status achieved by Vatimo in the context of European philosophy through the awarding of this important recognition, which, as he commented, um, uh, was the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in philosophy. Um, then there are entries like Capitalism, Liberalism, Politics, Democracy, written by Silvia Massini, and similar ones um, in relation to his political and philosophical views. Um, there are author-based entries such as Heidegger, a very important entry written by David Webb, uh, Derrida, Echo, Gadamer, Parison, uh, the American philosopher Richard Rorty, uh, among others which situate his thought in relation to other philosophers who acted as mentors, friends, or references at different points of his career. Um, other terms such as Turin and Europe or European Parliament provide information on his personal background and activity outside of the academic field. Um, so uh, I will mention briefly some of the challenges of editing this book, which I think applies uh, to philosophical dictionaries in general. Um, the first was to select uh, the keywords in a way that would make justice to the breadth 
of Vattimo's long career and philosophical production, um, while also reducing them to a number that will be manageable within the limitations of a book like that. Um, so this requires some keywords to be cross-listed with others or subsumed under other terms. Uh, I mentioned here the example of charity, caritas, which has been uh, subsumed under religion and also referred in ontological difference and theology. Uh, and that certainly is a decision that uh, can be questioned in terms of the specificity of the definition when a term does not get its own entry. Um, however, uh, a dictionary of this kind is never exhaustive and uh, is prone to leave out some important elements um, of, the, of the subject of our analysis here, Batimo. Um, and it should act more as a stimulus for new research than as a place to find all the answers. And that's the spirit with which I approach this project. Um, another challenge, but also I will say an opportunity I face as an editor is the question of voice um, or style. So even though there is a general editorial tone that I aim to maintain Throughout the entries, I also wanted to preserve the individual author style and approaches, um, also due to the fact that the authors come from a variety of backgrounds and linguistic traditions. So some differences are to be expected in the way the key terms have been developed, uh, which also has to do with the relative importance of a term within Vatimo's oeuvre. But a book of this kind needs to remain polyphonic, to be authentically choral and collective. Uh, and multiplicity, um, although it's not a key word in, that has its own entry in the dictionary, it was a concept that Vatimo valued very much. Um, it's very well known that uh, he was averse to what he called uh, pensiero unico, um, we could say thought of the one in English, um, which is the real obverse of weak thought, another important concept he developed um, and that made him in a way uh, famous in the not only in the panorama of philosophical discourse. Um, in a way, this dictionary could be sort of as a Tower of Babel of sort in a positive sense when there is a polyphony of voices um, coexisting together, but not necessarily following one direction. Um, so in a true polyphonic fashion, this is a text that can be open at any page. Uh, the articles can be read in any order. Um, there are cross-references that point to particular paths that one can follow. Um, however, terms such as Heidegger, Nietzsche, or Wicksot are certainly some of the three um, most important keywords, the ones that carry the narrative, let's say. And it's where someone unfamiliar with Vatimus philosophy should probably begin. Uh, but I would also add other terms such as art and aesthetics, hermeneutics, interpretation, religion, politics, a difference, metaphysics, nihilism, just to get an orientation around three main areas of Vatimus thought, uh, namely art, politics, and religion, um, and his key methodology, which is hermeneutics. But, you know, there are also interesting surprises awaiting the reader, hopefully, um, the possibility of seeing new constellations emerge out of the terms conversing with each other and across the dictionary. Uh, in ways that make some keywords emerge uh, at different points in the reading, uh, such as the case, at least for me, for example, of terms like undenken um, or convalescence, verwindung, or terms like violence and kenosis, um, which get um, more cross-references citations than initially expected. And so the hope is precisely this, that this dictionary is not simply used as a tool for research and definition of key terms, but also as a possible generator of new points of focus in the work of Vatimo and of new intertextual readings uh, with other authors who are intersected their paths with him or participated in a broader conversation with his work. Um, I will close my remarks. I see that we are coming to the 15 minutes mark. Oh, we actually went beyond already, but um, the most important part of the dictionary is uh, the authors. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud to say that they're not only all of most of the major published scholars of Vatimo's work, both from the Italian as well as the European and Anglo-American tradition, 
um, in a variety of fields that reflect the range of Vatimo's thought, but we also made room for emerging and young scholars, uh, many of whom are recent uh, doctoral graduates or even PhD candidates who are taking Vatimo's work into new and original interpretations and connections. And that to me, particularly as an educator, is an important detail in that it honors the legacy of Vatimo uh, also as a beloved teacher and mentor. And it's exciting to see how uh, new generations of scholars critically engage Vatimo's work and bring fresh perspectives to his thought. And my hope is that this dictionary will play a part in this ongoing process. So I will stop here and uh, give the word now to Silvia Massini. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moro, for um, inviting me uh, and us to this conversation and for the dictionary, of course. So I was uh, honored and pleasure to write three more entries. And this dictionary was already, um, I was immediately enthusiastic uh, about the project, but now it gets an even bigger uh, significance after um, Vatimo's um, departure from here, so to say. And, uh, well, it's a conversation. I like the definition of a polyphonic um, voice. Um, in this term, I wrote uh, three more entries, so um, Utopia, uh, Democracy, and Enlightenment. And as you said, so that was also the attempt to show how uh, each entry is connected uh, among them themselves, but also with the others. Um, these three entries, I like to see them as a kind of political constellation where politics uh, in Vatimo, in my opinion, is an aesthetical praxis. Um, and uh, for different reasons, but uh, above all, because I see um, politics in Vatimo as a participative, plural and polyphonic creation. So something that we create together and not the so-called uh, politics of bureaucrats as Hannah Arendt called uh, this or what we are used to see in television, but a collective um, taking part of uh, our life so, together. And I like to see that uh, as a participative uh, creation, but also pre-action because it's a really um, demanding the action uh, of everybody or inviting actually. Um, as we know, Vatimo was um, also very active um, uh, in dialogue with uh, contemporary topics. He uh, regularly wrote in newspapers about culture, but also politics. He was also a European in European Parliament. Um, and then, uh, as uh, Simonetta said, also as a teacher, contributed to the political um, debates uh, in the broader sense of the word. I would like to start maybe to give a, a small overview of these terms because it's a small key to enter for those who do not know yet uh, Vatimo. But in any case, the dictionary is um, intriguing also for people that um, have dialogue uh, with Vatimo and with his books uh, since a long time. So I work... Um, on him since 20 years and still I found so new and um, refreshing views um, and also in order to deepen his uh, thought. And well, my first encounter with Vatimo was about one of these three terms, so utopia, the, the term also in the dictionary is uh, utopia bloch, as uh, Simonetta said, it's also about the, the um, authors that uh, were in dialogue with Vatimo and bloch is not the most famous uh, interlocutor of Vatimo, but uh, Vatimo uh, taught a course in his few, in his early years on Bloch. And Bloch was a kind of accompanying his uh, thought and development till um, also the last um, formulations of uh, Vatimo's thought. Um, well, the first time I met uh, Vatimo, by the way, uh, uh, I went to him and so I'm writing my PhD on uh, Bloch and Vatimo. And then uh, I like to tell the story because it shows his ironical and also humble in some terms um, attitude. And then he said, is that uh, in alphabetic order, right? <laughs> so that's Bloch and Vatimo there. Um, and yes, it was alphabetic, <laughs> that's my answer. Mm. 
And this term utopia, I think it's so relevant today to, when we talk about uh, politics, because uh, today it's subversive to think about uh, utopia and dreams in a world that we think uh, the world is already there uh, with uh, this ecological crisis, uh, well, catastrophe that we are facing now. Uh, but Vatima always had its weak thought is uh, the other way around. Violent thought is not that is not strong, not at all. You need uh, much strength to to be optimistic nowadays. And also, as this concept was thought, and then this term is also a bit discriminated in my opinion. So we use the term utopia to say I ah, a castle in the cloud or uh, an abstract dream. But so this negative connotation, as it happens in Vatimo, in any case, also in terms of uh, weak thought, <laughs> can so be seen in this way. Uh, he took that from Bloch and above all the first writings of Ernst, so German philosopher Ernst Bloch, um, the spirit of utopia, where Bloch talks about uh, utopia as a kind of um, catalysator of dreams, hopes, and projects of people. And then uh, for Bloch, so we can have individual hopes and projects, but also collective. And Vatimo stressed the collective dreams uh, to show that these dreams were not only abstract, but also concrete. So to see that many dreams are uh, projects that are alternatives to uh, the word as it is, or the word described by some people uh, that say the word is this way. So what Vatimo then developed in the last um, production, so when he talks about uh, with Santiago <laughs> Zabala, uh, politics of descriptions, so the politics that say uh, this is the uh, a necessity to act this way because economy is asking to do uh, this or political order is asking to do this way, Vatimo had an alternative, always um, plural views. So then he said, this is the, a, a certain way of calling realism, but it is a fetishism of the facts. So a way of saying, this is a fact, we cannot touch, we cannot change that. And bringing the idea of utopia and dreams shows really concretely that there are other alternatives uh, there to be realized. Um, Vatim already at the beginning of his uh, thought made this uh, comparison between this politics uh, of uh, descriptions and um, metaphysics. Also in metaphysics, we have one fundament, one way of interpreting being and reality and substance, and then also to describing people. And then with, uh, with these multiplications of views, then we have uh, a plural a dream and a plural project. And that's not only abstract, but also building on tendencies of history. The historical process was always so important for Vatimo, even for talking about um, weak thought. Uh, he never said it's the only, it's the best uh, thought. So sometimes he makes, he made jokes on that, but so this is one of the interpretations, but for him, the interpretation that worked better uh, for uh, these times and this specific uh, historical uh, time. And what is peculiar of Vatimo is also to uh, analyze concepts critically, also his own concepts, even utopia. He said, yes, it's positive. Yes, it's a discriminated um, term, but we also have to pay attention not to exaggerate, as he said, not to see that as the only uh, saving power because uh, he did a kind of, uh, well, school of suspect and critical analysis of his own positions and said, utopia, if utopia is seen as one dream, one political project, one way of doing arts, then it is uh, again, running the risk of uh, making as metaphysics to being a kind of violent imposition of only one order. If we have one dream, then uh, we see that as absolute, universal, and then as a consequence, we have to impose that everywhere with violence. So then he reflected on this um, 
difficulty to see utopia and then he analyzed also the counter utopia so these dystopias that we call also with novels as uh, Orwell's 1984 or uh, Huxley Brave New Work and he analyzes that in, a, in my opinion in a very interesting way so he said here these counter utopias show an apocalyptic world um, dystopian world with difficulties, uh, sometimes also uh, ecological catastrophe and so, but not because of an error or not because of bad intentions. Sometimes it was really uh, these counter utopias were the realization of one uh, idea uh, that we had. And uh, this is the other entry that I wrote, enlightenment with all the good intentions of enlightenment uh, everybody is equal, everybody uh, is free, uh, and reason is bringing this liberation. But then Vatimo noticed, yeah, but which uh, equality are we using? Which concept? White, Western, male, um, model. So again, one model, one model of reason. And he then said, okay, I don't want to throw away utopia in any case, but we are conscious now of these dangers. And therefore, let's go to the heterotopia. So to have multiple dreams and to exchange ideas of these projects. So the conversation is what he sees as democracy. And democracy is not an ancient idea that we have to uh, gain again and impose as it was, but something that we are creating while we are doing that. So this aesthetical and political creation is this um, dialogue that uses also reason, but not as the only one. This is a kind of distortion, and Simonetta talked about andenken, and this pietas also in other writings. So this uh, affective also, uh, this feeling for the world of the past, for uh, the legacy of our traditions, but then reinterpret it. So without taking them as a fixed um, and fossilized uh, element. I think this is also important today with all uh, populism, uh, but also cultural um, reflections that we have. So, how can we include the proveniences and the past and the different cultures, but then without seeing them as a fixed um, model with a fixed idea? And um, this is also a way of then opening to the excluded and also the weak. So in Vatimo, we have this um, development that he uh, told, so from the weak thought to the thought of the weak. And then through this dialogue and multiplication, then uh, Vatimo said, priority now is to the voices that we have not heard till now. Um, they open into different cultures and therefore to um, feminist and post-feminist thought, post-colonial thought, uh, but also as what I'm writing um, at the moment now to try to develop or to, to keep dialogue with uh, Vatimo's thought. Also ecology, nature has been uh, exploited and uh, not heard for a long time. So these are some of the legacies of this democracy that, as uh, Simonetta said, is a work in progress and also his idea of this. And well, I look forward to the conversation on this and many others uh, and many other entries. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. I sit down. Um, David, what are Take it further from here. Hello, um, hello everyone. And um, uh, yeah, I'd like to begin by just thanking Simonetta also for putting this volume together. Um, <clears throat> it's it's very welcome. Uh, it's a it's a great volume to have, and I really appreciate the th the thinking that that went into it that you've described already. Um, um, thank you very much for the invitation to, to take part in it. It's, a, it's, it's an honor to do so. Um, and um, one thing I'd like to mention also is that you, uh, something you didn't mention, which was your truly excellent introduction to the volume. I think that um, um, uh, anyone with an interest in Vatimo will really um, get a, a huge amount from reading, uh, reading your introduction, which is a great introduction to the volume, but to, to Vatimo as well. Um, so um, 
thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for that as well. Um, my first connection with Vatican well, came really uh, when I was a graduate student, um, and um, uh, it happened that I um, that I uh, spoke Italian, and um, I wasn't at that time very familiar with with Vatimo's work, but uh, but a publisher got in touch to to see if I was I would be interested in translating something and so of Vatimo's because uh, in those days. Uh, people who were prepared to uh, to jump into a translation uh, who who were familiar with philosophy and with Italian were probably not not many in number. So uh, so I got an invitation and I, I gratefully accepted. And so I had this very interesting experience of really immersing myself in Vatimo's thinking. Um, through almost through the language first of all you know which is quite interesting <laughs> uh rather than starting off with kind of preconceived ideas about the sort of themes i was interested in or what problems i was interested in i just immersed myself in the text and uh sort of uh, in some ways um uh i mean i, I yeah Santiago and, and, and Silvia and, and Simonetti yourself here are, are more expert, I think, in uh, his thinking, a broad range of his thinking than I am. But I, I feel like I started my familiarity with Vatimo by um, really diving into the text and sort of learning it from the inside out, almost in, in a certain way, through through um, through working with his 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 text, really sort of sentence by sentence. Um, through the translations, which was a uh, a really thoroughly uh, rewarding thing to do, um, and um, I've, I've always been grateful for that opportunity. the uh, The entry which uh, you invited me to to write was uh, was on Heidegger, um, and so really, what I'd like to do now is just to say a few words about some of the key um, the key themes, I think, that that uh, that I touched on in the entry, and which, obviously, in doing so, I think are, are important ones for um, for for, uh, for for the work of Gianni Vattimo. Um, Heidegger, I think, was one of the most important people um, philosophers for 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 Vattimo, um, and the one perhaps along with Nietzsche, who he was most continually in dialogue with through, through, his, uh, through his work. You know. And um, Heidegger seems to, open, for Vatima, open the possibility of a, a new experience um, of late modernity or post-modernity. Um, uh, in a way that avoids the reference back to principles and canons and origins and uh, and so on. You know. So uh, where to uh, where to begin? Because actually, that was in writing. The, in writing, I have to say, in writing the entry, that was one of the challenges of writing the entry. Because Heidegger was sort of there were so many um, traces of Heidegger. In, in his thinking, that it was actually quite difficult to figure out where to begin and <laughs> where to go next to kind of link these things together, link these things together. I've done my best with that, I think. But I think one of the most important places must be uh, with the idea of um, the history of metaphysics, uh, however. And um, if uh, if uh, if Heidegger's most famous book, perhaps being in time, is is really important for for Vatimo in terms of sort of setting the direction of uh, of his thinking about Heidegger. It was uh, more the, uh, the 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 later work of Heidegger's that that occupied him the um, the most, I think. But from that first book, being in time, you really get the um, the idea of uh, of the history of metaphysics as a forgetting of being, as a forgetting of the question of being, which is uh, Heidegger's um, 
one of Heidegger's main ideas, she would say, and on one to which certainly Vatimo uh, continued to uh, respond throughout his work. And what does that mean, really? Um, well, for Heidegger, it meant that the, our understanding of, of being had got narrowed down just to uh, being present, in effect, what, what is present. And one way to, to say, to describe what that uh, means is to say that, that for Heidegger, we'd forgotten the ontological difference, which is the idea of the difference between beings and uh, and being. And as a consequence of that, in the history of metaphysics, we've come to think of uh, being as if it were something that could be known, that could be defined or conceived in some way. And, um, and hence, uh, could be turned into a, a first principle of some kind, which is, which is of course the the move that um, Heidegger resisted, but that Vatimo too, in his turn, resisted in his own very distinctive uh, way. Right? Uh, so, in response to this idea of metaphysics uh, as a forgetting of being. Um, we have hermeneutics as uh, an interpretation then. What's the task of hermeneutics? Not an interpretation of uh, the meaning of, of uh, things as such. What, do, what are things telling us? But of the very event of difference, the ontological difference, by which being itself is disclosed in the world. Now, this event, through which being is disclosed in the world uh, could be understood in terms of, uh, as Heidegger does, in terms of uh, a conception of truth, which for Heidegger um, is 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 about the way in which things are disclosed to us in the world before we can actually then make judgments about them or form ideas about them take up uh, a stance towards them like that okay so it's before our idea of the correspondence theory of truth um, and it's uh, it's before we as I said we we take up that explicit kind of propositional attitude towards things it's about how things show themselves to us um, and for uh, for Heidegger crucially and crucially for Vatimo, this event of truth is historical. So we're not always dealing with the same way in which things disclose themselves to us. Now, Vatimo in particular then takes this to mean that our task is not to produce statements, our task as thinkers or philosophers, uh, is not to produce statements that that uh, correspond to things, not to produce, come up with true statements, or true ideas as such, but rather to adopt a stance towards the world that corresponds to the way in which things show themselves to us. Uh, and that means how things show themselves to us in our own particular historical situation. For example, through art um, or through new forms, the new forms of information uh, and communication technology and so on. Something which of course Vatimo wrote uh, a great deal about and, and in which he saw great uh, possibilities. So in this, Vatimo sees an opportunity for interpretation actually to change the world um, precisely by changing our understanding of it and of ourselves in relation to it. It's about this stance, as I see it, it's about this sort of stance that we can take up towards the world, our relation to the world because of how we come to understand um, uh, the way in which being uh, is disclosed to us uh, in our time. However, uh, in order to do this, we still have to take up some relation to the history of metaphysics because we can't just pretend that it's um, um, 
can, that we can simply leave it behind. So we have this theme then of the end of metaphysics as well. Now, Heidegger underlines that um, we, we are caught, we are caught up in our time in the ending or closure of metaphysics. And while on the one hand, we must avoid renewing uh, an appeal to first principles of any kind. On the other hand, as I just said, we also have to resist thinking that we can just turn our back on metaphysics and walk away from it as if we can leave it behind altogether. So that leaves us in this very um, problematic position. And it's a problem we have to think about if we are to respond to the way in which being shows itself in our time, right? which is the hermeneutic uh, task for, uh, for Vatima. Right? So how do we do this? Well, through, uh, for Heidegger, um, a, um, a form, a specific form of overcoming that he called the right? uh, which can also be described as a, a convalescence, uh, or a, a gentle sort of twisting free from what nonetheless remains the uh, kind of horizon of, of our thinking. We can't, as I say, just turn away from it altogether. Now, for, for Vatima, this vivindum, this, this, uh, this convalescence uh, was a, the weakening of being. This is the weakening of being. So this is this leads directly into his his idea of uh, of weak thought. Thinking then becomes not just a uh, a, a making present of something. Certainly not just a making present of the past, but a kind of a kind of leave taking of of the past. Um, um, Kind of leave taking of metaphysics uh, as a set of possibilities that we, we we have accept have been ours we accept that they've come down to us and yet at the same time we begin to find our way out of them and and, um, and I think here uh, I was just struck by what uh, Silvia Mazzini was saying about uh, about dreams uh, utopias right <laughs> Is that uh, plural dreams as well? It's it's a there's this interesting conjunction between uh, thinking as a kind of remembrance, and the, the Heideggerian term there is and then that, that Vatima wrote about, and uh, and a dreaming uh, as you were saying as well, which is rather lovely, a rather lovely conjunction, I think. Um, so this really is, is central, I think, to, to Vatimo's uh, understanding of the hermeneutic relation of thinking to its metaphysical past uh, in a way which is also open and open to the future in certain ways. Right? Now, um, That openness and that plurality, I think, just to mention one or two things quickly, because I've got an eye on the time, uh, also connects with the idea of uh, a left Heideggerianism that, that Vatimo uh, celebrated very much, um, against the idea that Heidegger somehow is offering us some strong sense of being that we had to go back to that would provide a, a new ground of some kind actually the hermeneutic sense of a continual openness and reinterpretation out of our own history is led into this idea of a left <clears throat> uh, heideggerianism uh, instead now um i was going to mention one or two more things here but i'm probably just going to on the time perhaps i'll i'll, I'll move on through uh in the end i think if uh heidegger calls our attention back to the idea of the ontological difference which for him was really the, the one thing the one idea you know as he said every thinker has one key idea for heidegger it's probably the ontological difference uh between beings and being 
if Heidegger calls our attention back to this, um, for Vatimo, we cannot return to a single sense about what this might mean. And that's, that's I think, one of the really interesting challenges that he presents to, to us. Um, we can't go back to a single determination of, 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 of difference because to do so would we would start straying back towards a, uh, a metaphysics again in some way as and some fixed point that we could we could go to difference is not only just not given as such but because it's historical we continually have to keep thinking about what this might mean about how being is given to us um, and um, how being is given to us in plural ways now and as history uh, changes. And that's really the task then of, 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 of hermeneutic philosophy, I think, for, for him is to interpret being as difference and as that occurs in our time, you know, without thinking that we can finally answer that question. And so it remains an ongoing uh, and open, an open task. The um, one final just uh, reflection really on, on thinking about Heidegger and, 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 and Vatimo. Um, uh, one th actually, one thing I didn't do in just talking through some of the themes very quickly here uh, was mention all of the many other entries which intersect with this. There are, the, I had a few names and connections and, and entries jotted down, but there are in, in the end there are almost too many. Um, but there's some really wonderful entries uh, through the volume on a lot of the things that I've mentioned just now. Um, and um, as you were saying, Simonetta, the, 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 the connections between all the entrances and where the cross references, I think is one of the really valuable parts of, of the book. One of the valuable things that we get from, uh, from reading it. And that's so I found. Um, just one last thought of, about Vatim and Heidegger. I think, Vatimo gives us a really distinctive um, reading of Heidegger. Um, but, I mean, there are many, many readings of, of Heidegger that we can find. Uh, it's a reading that shows how Heidegger, Heidegger's work can really be um, brought alive, I think, in thinking that is philosophical, Absolutely. But also more than just philosophical in the sense that it's not just about creating another reading of Heidegger and another interpretation of key texts. Um, one of the things that's so uh, wonderful about reading Vatimo and Vatimo on Heidegger is how that reading becomes uh, connected to so many other things that matter to us from from art and politics and and ethics and uh, and everything else that that he does this in a way which i think is um, uh, almost unique i think in in readers of heidegger and that's one of the things that i think is really most um brilliant and and, and valuable about about his work so thank you thank you david we appreciate your thoughts um Move on to Santiago Zabala. <clears throat> That's me. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this online book launch, which is very comfortable from, from my from my home. Um, well, I, I the first thing I have to say about the dictionary, I think it's important is that Batimo knew about it and he also received a copy and he had a copy at home. Uh, I think since since as soon as it came out. So I know he looked through over it and uh, and he knew about it because I talked to him many times about it uh, during the past years. And he was very excited, of course. And I think he was actually also quite surprised. It sounded very metaphysical, like David would say, sort of a, too much, uh, we shouldn't go that far. And he said that Simonetta has gone that far and has produced this, this very valuable book, which uh, I like to see this, this this dictionary is not simply a dictionary about Gianni Battimo. I think it's it's more a book about contemporary philosophy. I think anyone working today in contemporary 
obviously continental philosophy. That's what philosophy is. But anyway, anyone working on contemporary continental philosophy has to use many of the dictionaries uh, in this in this series. But so I, I think all of them in some way, in particular this one, it's very useful as an introduction to what's going on in contemporary philosophy today. And, and so I don't think it's, it is only a dictionary, uh, only a tool to understand Batimo better. It's not so simple. It goes a little bit further than that. And I think there are many indications for that because um, the dictionary does not, I don't, the dictionary obviously gives you all the, you know, if you have, if you work on Batimo now and I, and I receive a lot of people at the, at the university because we have the archive. So we receive a lot of students that come over to, to do a PhD on Batimo. So for them, having having this dictionary, it's, it's very important. It's it's really, but the dictionary, it's a little bit what Heidegger was for Batimo. I think, uh, for, I think that, and I, I agree with the thing that uh, David said before, but, you know, for Batimo, uh, for Batimo, Heidegger was the starting point. Right? He's, he's not as, he's not the, the, um, the common Heideggerian that, Basically, it's they're working on Heidegger and they just explain everything Heidegger or try to interpret everything Heidegger said. Jani was, he moved forward. So it's a starting point to do philosophy. And I think this dictionary is also a very good starting point, not simply to learn about Batman, but also to start to work, to, to do philosophy. So you know that there is a different, there is this thing, this philosophy called Pensiero Debole, with which you can do aesthetics, ethics, politics, as Silvia was talking before. There are many things that one can, can do with it. So I think that's one of the, the most... Also, I also think it's very important that uh, Simonetta has managed to not to invite uh, Batimo scholars, uh, which it could have... She could have reduced everything to Batimo scholars, but Batimo is not only about his, uh, his, uh, his students, like me. He's much more than that. He's about many others, who have also participated in the dictionary. I'm thinking of, in particular, younger scholars like Gregorio Trenti and uh, Serafina Appel, who Serafina is, would soon finish her PhD, I think in, in April. And um, and so, and, and also scholars that have nothing, not that don't really have anything to do with Batimo, like Ivelisse Perniola, for example, who never studied with Batimo. And, um, but of course, Batimo is a very important author that can, he did not, he, he did not only need to rely on his students for a dictionary to come out. And the fact that Simonetta is not a direct uh, disciple of, of Batimo is an indication of this. So uh, you can imagine also for me, it's very important to have the dictionary because people that come to visit the archive see the dictionary right there. And so what else can you ask for? The only thing you can ask for is Batimo coming inside, but that's not going to happen and, and it's not necessary either. So. Having said these things about the dictionary, and also I, I think it's important to remember that this dictionary would not have been possible without the translations of David, without the monograph of Silvia, and also the translation of um, Bob Bargenti, who is also online now, I think, and so many other disciples of Batimo, Federico Cernone, and so many others. So I think this is a sort of uh, everybody coming together and moving forward. So the idea is moving forward where? And and this is where I, I I make a few I would like to make a few comments on on the entry that I was kindly asked to to write about. Gift for lectures, I was there. I actually in part organized them because I sort of set everything up. I remember side story that Batimo two weeks before the lectures called me and said, "Can we move this to like next year or something?" And and you can imagine the people at Gift for were were very scared, were, were very angry. You can't move this. They've been organized for. A year and a half or two years i think so he did go and he did prepare the lectures and uh, it was a lot of fun and but the lectures were important for Batu because the lectures were beside how the significance of the gifted lectures it was also important to sort of put an end put finish off something that he was trying to to write that he took a very long time to write which was sort of to put to put the dots on this idea of an ontology of actuality, which is something that he always had in mind, that he always was also very perplexed to, to set up because on, ontology of actuality is an expression of Michel Foucault, ontology de l'actualité, in opposition to in ontology de la vérité, which would be an ontology of truth, which would probably be what uh, analytic philosophers do. But Batimo, 
he was a little bit ahead of uh, even of me, I see, because I'm I'm opposing continental philosophy to analytic philosophy. But actually, there's something worse going on, which is new realism or or, or, or ontology and all these things, which really are uh, sort of the cancer of contemporary philosophy. It's really uh, sort of going back to Kant to the first Kant. It's really it's something that's very strange that has a lot to do also with politics. In other words, with if you read when this new realism thing started, it started precisely the sec basically at the beginning of the century, and it begins also with this whole return to order, which is, there is going on now. Right? Since 9-11 is a huge, I mean, we were much freer in the 70s than where we are now. Okay, which well, I don't I don't need to make any any I refer to any particular conflict now, but I can simply point out uh, how uniform we are now to to a few a few um, internet companies, and uh, not to mention from a financial point of view that there is literally no alternative whatsoever. So Batimo he managed to link together this new so-called new nothing new happened in philosophy, but anyway, this new philosophy, new realism, with this ongoing return to order, where there's basically no alternative, not only to capitalism, but to so many other things. And it is important to read them together because right wing populism also calls for a return to order, right? a return to order, a return to, to reality. In other words, to, to leave all this postmodern, um, also political correct, I think that it's a problem, but anyway. And, and the problem with all this is that all this is, is predicated on the assumption that postmodernity is Spanish, which is something strange to declare because first of all, you have to know what it is because I'm sure if some of you have seen, um, there's a nice video of Zizek asking Jordan Peterson, who do you refer to? Who are you referring to about this postmodern, postmodernist? And Jordan Peterson did not manage to say a single name because they, they just don't know. So Gianni managed to, in, to individuate this return to order, which is a return to right-wing populism, and also on the other side, the absence of left-wing populism, which is something that it's a very, very dangerous also. The fact, why isn't there all of Europe now it's in the hands of the right? And this is something that Batimo has, has managed to link together with this new philosophical, and again, there's nothing new in new realism, but anyway, with this new uh, position. So the Gifford lectures are really about this, and I think they are very important because I wouldn't call call the the book that that on which the lectures are um, are based of reality its most important book. I don't think that's probably its most important book, but it is his book, the most important book we have in order to do what we're supposed to do with this dictionary, which is to move beyond Batimo, in other words, to move forward. And uh, I think Batimo has given us a very clear indication that new realism is one of the biggest problems we have. And of course, that hermeneutic philosophy is the only way to oppose it. And um, I think that the dictionary is not simply limited to this, to what and you should also read the other entries, not only my entries, but uh, I think that one other entry, which is very important to read, um, because I'm sure that many of you know that be, together with the dictionary, you, we also have Batimo's autobiography, Not Being God, which is a very, it's a very nice book. It, it's a lot of fun to read that he wrote together with uh, Giorgio Bartellini. So, and what's interesting about the, um, but the dictionary that it also it's also a complement to Batimo's autobiography. Uh, if you read Cla Claudio Gallo's entry on Turin, you will see this very difficult relationship he had with the establishment in Turin. Um, he's, he's the only philosopher who was never published by Enaudi, which is like la creme de la creme of Italian uh, publishing, which of course it is not, but still, and he was never allowed there because of his uh, workers' background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that dictionary, it's, you can imagine as a supervisor of the archive, how happy I am that we have the dictionary and um, and we are, uh, I'm sure that Batimo, well, I know that Batimo is very happy with it, but the, pro the most important thing is that we are happy with it. And uh, as far as I can see from the archives, we are very, very happy. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, definitely the happiness is, uh, is mutual and um, I'm very glad that you ended with this note of 
<clears throat> going beyond Vatimo, which is kind of uh, the thoughts, you know, the thought in my mind at this moment, um, which I'm sure is a, is a question that uh, many of us have, which is, you know, what is the legacy of Gianni Vattimo, uh, particularly now after his departure? So, and I, I, perhaps that's a question we can entertain, um, but I see there's a question in the Q&A, so I would go straight into that, mindful of time. Um, and again, thanks everybody for being here and feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I have a question um, for Professor Webb by Abdullah Basaran. Um, we are familiar with Vatimo's various, uh, quote, uh, readings of Heidegger, but this mostly focus on Heidegger's earlier writings and, and, and the care. But I'm wondering how Vatimo considered Heidegger's later thoughts on the other beginning, Anfang, and rereading the Greek classics such as Heracl Heraclitus and Parmenides. Um, did Vatimo ever deal with this line of thought? Hmm. That's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, the uh, the um, I think the I don't know of anywhere where he dealt with Heraclitus and ancient Greek thought. That's not to say it's not there. Perhaps. Um, Santiago and Silvia may know. Um, uh, the, um, the idea of uh, the, the other beginning, it seems to me, is um, again, I'm not familiar with a detailed interpretation of that element of Heidegger's writing at that than those really dense works of the 30s, but um, in particular. But um, I think it, I think you can see the connection to to, home, to the to the idea of of, of hermeneutics as a um, as a. And it goes back to that conjunction where I was, I was <laughs> I mentioned earlier between remembrance and dreaming, I suppose, is the idea that hermeneutics can be uh, uh, the recovery of a possibility, but it's a possibility that we don't have to go back to and, and be faithful to as something which then dictates our future. It's, it's a way of... Um, uh, it's a way of being true to a, uh, a disclosure of being that opens up new possibilities for us. Actually, um, I guess that, that's the way I would I, I would put it. And so, um, I'd be interested to know if 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 if, uh, if my colleagues here, if, if Santiago and Silvia and Simonet have a, another view on it. But my my feeling would be that you you don't find it an extended interpretation of this in highly in Vatimo's work. But that it almost animates his thinking in certain ways. I find his thinking consistent very much with it. So um, I would um, I would say that. Thank you. David. Anyone else wants to contribute to that question? Silvia. Oh, thank you, Santi. Uh, well, I uh, I totally agree. And um, so, as uh, as far as I know, he the, the second Heidegger is crucial for uh, Vatimo and for his view on arts. The question concerning technology. So this is his way of uh, coming back to the different Anfang and beginning. Um, yeah. Above all, uh, yes, in terms of uh, arts as a, an event or these creations or showing creating new words but not in the interpretation, as I think I interpret the question of uh, Parmenides and um, the other so specific philosophers. So uh, that's also, and this opening to the future, so also the, for the works of art and so on, the, the idea is, uh, as uh, David now was stressing, 
so recreating that, not coming back in this way, maybe adding only to show that Vatimo was uh, so for diversity, diverse, uh, diverse voices. He was uh, including a lot also Hannah Arendt, um, and in these terms, so it's a way of connecting a bit uh, through Heidegger. So his idea of democracy was in dialogue, uh, in my opinion, also with Hannah Arendt. Yeah. So it's it's coming back to. Um, ancient Greek world, but then reinterpreting for the future. Um, we do have another question, a um, couple actually. <clears throat> One by Sam Kachansky. Um, Sam is a PhD candidate at IDSVA, so he begins by thanking us for the dictionary uh, that involves many of his uh, professors. Um, the question concerns the relationship between art, truth, and the development of secular science. Vatibo's work, particularly Art's Claim to Truth, uh, delves into the concept of Art's Claim to Truth and its connection to Hans Georg Gadamer's theory of aesthetics, uh, providing an alternative to rationalistic, positivistic criticism of art. Given Vatimo's exploration of the autonomy of art as the sphere of aesthetic experience and his emphasis on the development of secular science, an important question will be how he sees the role of art and aesthetic experience in the context of truth and the evolving scientific landscape. Perhaps Santi or Silvia can take that on. I think Silvia mentioned something right. about the politics that becomes aesthetic, but Santiago, you were involved with that book, especially. Right, I edit the the English updated uh, edition of that book, and um, I, I I I understand the question. It's a it's a it's a very good question. I think that Vatimo's aesthetics it's 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 a very important part of his philosophy. It's actually very important at the beginning. That book is actually has a lot of essays which go back to I think even nineteen sixties, end of nineteen sixties, and um, I think Vatimo has he went. I mean the. Heidegger's concept of truth was very important for Vatimo's first investigations into Heidegger, which of course led also to the problem of art. And um, and I think that 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 essay, that, that book, Art Claim to Truth, which in Italian is titled Poesia Ontologia, it's a very good introduction to Vatimo aesthetics, but I don't think it's it's the only place where one should look in for Vatimo's aesthetics. In other words, um, in beyond interpretation, I think that's a very important place where you can find more things about um, the role of art for Vatimo. But I think also art is a, it's a good concept for Vatimo, though I would not define Vatimo as a philosopher of art, particularly interested in art. But art for Vatimo, it's in, important at least as where the disclosure of the event of being can take place. So that's something that I think that he he um, he pointed in that direction. Uh, and, and he actually even has an, um, a small essay we have in the, in the archive titled On the Aesthetics Can Save Us, which is a way of, of following uh, what Heidegger said about um, about God. And, um, and well, the problem is that for Batimo, Batimo was not very interested in to follow Adorno and all this. For him, the relation of politics with art is he did not, there's something he had some sort of distrust in Adorno. Which probably had to do with um, with with everything that came after Adorno, also with the Habermas and all that. And uh, but I think for Batimo, the role of museum, the role of art in general, has to be read through ontology, through Heidegger's ontology. That that's what he's trying to point us to. Um, I think that Batimo did take Heidegger as a starting point for many things, but in some other places he was very keen to follow what Heidegger was saying. And I think that maybe art is one of those places. While instead, of course, politics is not. He went for a leftist Heideggerian politics, which who knows what that means. Thank you, Santi. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Sylvia, but I have a question for you uh, specifically. So maybe, uh, you can interweave it with this uh, by Dayan Lukic, um, professor at IDSVA. Um, 
the question is related to um, what you mentioned er uh, already, Sylvia, namely, to what extent is Batimo influenced by Bloch, including stylistically, and how explicit was he about this influence? Um, and is Batimo continuing Bloch optimistic theology without God, so to speak? Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Dejan, for the great question. Um, yes, uh, well, I would say that uh, using a term of Bloch, uh, Bloch is uh, there in a kind of uh, latency in Vatimo. Um, it's uh, not so explicit at the end, or well, Vatimo quotes uh, Bloch also in the, um, the end of modernity, so not only in the early works, above all the Bloch of uh, Geiste Utopie, so Spirit of Utopia, so the first Bloch, referring to the question of the art, so then I try to connect the elements. So um, the first Bloch was analyzing, also written uh, in a very expressionistic way. So his style was beautiful. <laughs> By the way, there are some uh, publishers that say, no, Bloch is not uh, a philosopher, he's a writer, as if a philosopher would not be able to write well. Well, <laughs> this is the artist philosopher here, <laughs> please. Uh, but uh, so in this first book, so Spirit of Utopia, Bloch analyzes a lot, not only, but talks about, not only analyzes the avant-garde of the beginning of the 20th century. And this, um, the role of the avant-garde was uh, very important for Vatim, also for talking about this prophetic view, but not prophetic as inspired by, by God, but open into the future as well. So project, pro, making a projection and the project we have it in uh, in Heidegger, the Geworfenheit and then the authentic existence is also an individual uh, project, but here, goes in the direction of a collective one. And rightly, uh, you say this optimistic um, uh, op optimism without God. And well, in Bloch, there is this optimism, or thought Bloch says, um, yes, it can be realized or not. But uh, I prefer to believe that, because if we believe in that, uh, connected also with his interpretation of the praxis, then there are more possibilities that it can be realized. Mm, I think so. Therefore, it is there, Bloch in Vatimo. Stylistically, I would say they are pretty different, because uh, Vatimo, in my opinion, but maybe David can uh, say uh, more on that from the perspective of the translation, um, so that uh, Vatimo writes really well. Students appreciate also his very clear way of writing. And the same fantastic uh, style of uh, speaking and uh, giving lectures. So it's um, he worked also on television and making uh, accessible, complex uh, contexts without losing depth through his ironical view. But irony was not there only to make that entertainment, uh, well, he enjoyed that, but it was adding a value of deepening uh, the material. Maybe this teleology, so for Vatimo, Bloch is, maybe it's a bit more still, it's a kind of, um, he talks about multiversum, and I think Vatimo has a multi-diversum, so not one direction where everybody goes. Well, Bloch talks also about polyphony, but Vatimo is really more to say this heterotopia, so stressing these elements. So th th there are communalities, but also with uh, differences, I would say. But thank you for the question, because I'm coming back a bit to an ancient topic and then bring it to the future, as <laughs> we were saying. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, question by Stanley Bermudez, also a student at IBSVA. This is probably for Santiago. Um, he says, in an interview that Vatimo did for La, La Vanguardia in 2012, he mentions Hugo Chavez Venezuela as an example of that regime coming close to the ideal of a weak communism saving us. He states that Venezuela has tripled healthcare, reduced mortality rate by a third, eliminated illiteracy, reduced poverty by 72% since uh, 2003. Does any of you know if Vatimo still felt that way before his death about Venezuela? 
uh, given the mass exodus of Venezuela today, precisely because of lack of healthcare, basic necessities like food, water, electricity, etc., personal and public safety, and increased poverty. What good is eliminated illiteracy if the same people that now know how to read and write do not know what they are going to eat today? And I'm, I'm saying something. the first time I get these questions. You have co authored the, the book. No, the thing is, most of that an the answer to that question is actually in Sylvia's uh, book, uh, Making uh, Communism Hermeneutical. Um, if you read that book, which I'm happy to send you a PDF copy, copy which Sylvia agrees, of course, um, you will find the answer to that question there. A uh, few people always pointed that out. The thing is, we wrote the book in, it was published in 2011. And then in 2016, I think, or 17, we replied to all the essays and we had many questions like that. But anyway, the book was written. I mean, basically, the answer I have to give you is the reason why uh, Venezuela is in this situation it is now is one, because Chavez is not there anymore. I, I might, I should remind you that he died. Uh, he's now with Batimo, probably, or Batimo with Chavez, one of the two. And, um, and two is that, um, Venezuela has an international embargo uh, on, which uh, means that they don't get anything, no medicine, nothing for the past at least 25 years. So, I mean, I live in a country or any country basically that has an international embargo for more than a month will have serious problems. It's not a question of, it's not the fault of any particular politician. Um, one thing was Chavez, another thing is Maduro, the president that followed his, uh, followed his um, his presidency. So two different things. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, um, Patimo continued to be very much in favor of what Chavez has done. And uh, but not only him, also people like Noam Chomsky or well, the list is very long. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for reminding us of the book that uh, Sylvia co-edited. It's a very good book. I think we have it in our libraries. So. Um, Great. Uh, well, continuing with um, a topic we have touched upon earlier, Ana Fernandez asks, why is object-oriented ontology not philosophy? Uh, and why would thinking of objects as beings, as in art objects, would not be a way into weak thought? I wonder who, David or David. Sandy. <laughs> I was going to say Santiago, I'm sure you <laughs> you might have more of a, yeah, a view on uh, how that works from the, from Vatima. So I'm handing it, I'm handing that one to you. <laughs> oh, well, that's not fair. I just answered a difficult question. <laughs> and I come in between if you want to, I simply start <laughs> because... <laughs> Maybe I, I simply interpret the, the, the answer by saying that if I if I read that correctly, but I hope you help me probably go in the wrong direction. So is that uh, why is this oriented, um, object oriented ontology, is that also philosophy or not? So I would put that in a kind of the discussion of Adimo in uh, the adventures of differences, and then he developed mm -hmm. that later. Maybe this is also including a part of what I understood is Sam's uh, question about the role of sci science and this dialogue. And then uh, Vatimo is building on the reflections of Dilthe, uh, so that this division of uh, disciplines is also a kind of consequence of uh, mm -hmm. the metaphysical approach of the world. So we decide what is um, uh, ontology, and this is politics, and this is aesthetics, and then uh, Vatimo stressed the idea of interpretation, so of putting multiple voices and approaches, and also the historical um, mm -hmm. relevance of uh, a certain interpretation. So when he analyzes the paradigms uh, and the, uh, the, re the, the rhetorical revolution of uh, scientific paradigm with Kuhn, and then he says now, this is the interpretation that works better also for science. So science is not a kind of abstract monolithical uh, way and philosophy as well. So this object-oriented ontology 
if I understand the question correctly, and that's very intriguing, um, and I'm curious now what you think, <laughs> well, you all three, Simon, it as well. Uh, I, so then I would be included. Um, yeah, please. Uh, can I add, add a word to that? Um, um, a lot of the, um, a lot of my time over the last few years has been spent with um, with French philosophy of science and epistemology and historical epistemology and um, discourses like that. And um, uh, I think, um, so I'm, I'm not going to answer directly with respect to object-oriented ontology, but I think that um, it has a, it has a certain rather problematic relation with, with some of the things which are going on in those, in, in those areas. Uh, but what I think you really find um, in, in through philosophers such as, such as Bachelard and, uh, and Michel Serre and Bruno Latour uh, uh, is this idea that um, the world is a place of communication, basically. Right? So exactly what you were saying, Sylvia, that we, we should be, think not about the division between different disciplines, but about um, how they communicate and, and how different disciplines themselves communicate because the world which they are dealing with is a world which is in communication <laughs> and so the idea that we can simply divide it up into different sort of uh, uh, you know, disciplines and, and, and treat them separately is, is probably a mistake the um but that comes back i think to to a, 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 an idea which we can take from vatima which is this idea of uh, of um of a hermeneutics, of a, of conversation, and a, on a on a, a world of communication, and it's it's a world which comprises the uh, bit of inverted commas natural world. It's not it's not a world which has to be counterposed to that. It's just as a, a human world of conversation. It's very much uh, the the world we live in. Um, uh, it's the world of things as well. You know, so I, I would see it coming through that way. My, personally, I would, I would, um, I, I, I guess, approach that idea of things that way and see that Fatima's philosophy really has, I think, a contribution to make there and is is kind of part of that way of thinking in certain ways. Um, uh, and I, I would go that way rather than through object-oriented ontology myself, but. Um, Santiago, do you have anything to add? Well, the thing is, I, the problem is that we turn into objects. It's a sort of a problem after Hegel, for example. It's, it's not something you can't do, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a problem. I mean, um, mm. because if you talk to, if you talk to, you know, to most of, most of these philosophers, for example, one of the, one of the best ones, uh, where, um, Marcus Gabriel, he, he, you know, from that he moved to propose um, an objective um, morality, and he actually one of his last book is about a universal ethics for the world, which is sort of strange in mm -hmm. since he forgot to read Fanon and some other important authors. So uh, it's important to read the problem that beside the philosophical issues that you can have, you know, even Zizek has criticized them. Uh, I mean, of course, he's a Lacanian. How is not going to criticize someone who returns to object? Because what what's the deal there? So I have a pen and it's blue, and that's, if I'm really capable of explaining to you that it's blue, well, that's it. It's all finished there. There's nothing more. And in philosophy, what they've been trying to do for the past three thousand years is try to interpret and try to show what you can do with it, whether you like it, and you know, it's, it, things are not that easy, you know, in some way. Um, and it seems to me that. All this, all all this uh, OO ontology or speculative realism or new realism, all of that comes from one man called John Searle, okay, who was of course honored by George W. Bush because he was in favor of the war in Iraq. Why? Well, because he could de demonstrate objectively that they had weapons of mass destruction. So, from a realist point of view, the war was right. So that's where it takes you, and we explain that in uh, feminist communism. Um, and then again, in, in Sylvia's book, um, making communism hermeneutical, uh, but and that's a problem basically. So uh, it, 
And it's a big problem today because if you believe to you have to return to objects and uh, well, what you're falling into, not the person who did the question, but in general, all of everybody, is that you're falling into the, this trap of transparency. Uh, Stanley Fish has a very nice article, it's been a while now, but in the New York Times where he, he wrote, the greatest fake news of all is transparency. And that's what the new realists believe. They believe in transparency, that you can you have to you know get as close as possible to object. But, and that's sort of a problem when um, if, um, if you get the results of a blood test, blood test and you just start checking on your own what's written there, well, unless you're a chemist or a doctor, you won't really understand what's going on there. And that's where conspiracy theories all come, come from also today. So that's a problem. Um, we still need to have faith in what? In authorities, right? So if there's an expert in, uh, in Shakespeare, well, it might be a good idea to listen to what he has to say at least, rather than perhaps reading directly Shakespeare um, and so forth, or not to mention the Bible, of course. So the idea that we need some sort of mediator, okay, which in some ways are institutions, in some way are uh, communities, even what we have now here. I mean, none of us know Batimo by heart or can explain it better than anyone else. We can probably explain it a little bit better than what Batimo would explain his own philosophy because we always need a distance from what you write. But none of us have the authority uh, to say, well, we know everything he says. There is no transparency there. We all read him from a different perspective. But that different perspective, which is what David was talking about, the ontological difference, it's what counts. In other words, if you forget the difference, you fall back into reality, into realism, okay? So uh, that's a problem. So one last example, a few months ago at a, a art gallery, this artist uh, was telling me that I was wrong, that oh, oh, ontology was the way to go for artists and everything. And he, he exposed a tree, he actually bought a tree from the forest and put it into the gallery or something like that. And he was telling me the tree is real, it's a real tree. And I was telling him, no, it is not the same tree anymore. Uh, within the gallery, you can't do anything with it. You you can't touch it, you can't, it, it's not anymore that same object, right? So when you lose that context, that institutional context of, of art and even also philosophy, you fall back into metaphysics and well, you might believe Donald Trump that knows everything about the vaccine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I see that we're approaching the uh, an hour thirty minutes, so I, we should probably end it here. I I ask, want to acknowledge one comment by uh, Robert Balgenti, um, who writes. Uh, I don't have a question, but just want to thank uh, Simonetta for editing the dictionary and inviting me to participate, and to the entire panel for being and continuing to be great interpreters. John is thinking. Uh, nice to see you all together here and. Nice to know, Bob, uh, that you're there in the audience. And thank you so much for your work that you did do and continue to do. Um, uh, finally, uh, Monica from Brecht asks, uh, what was the term you re referenced as the sort of one? That's a poor translation, I guess. And maybe this is, <laughs> I'd like to ask David, how would you translate pensiero unico? Um, which is, you know, what, what uh, yeah. Batman was really worried about in terms of uh, the fact that, again, in this sort of postmodern era, we seem to have arrived at a situation. So unitary, unitary thought, perhaps. Unitary, unitary thought, yes. Unitary thought. Mainstream, mainstream. Mainstream. Um, mm. Is that thought that presents itself as the only possible way of thinking? There's no alternative. And, you know, that can be explained historically with... Um, uh, sort of the end of the Cold War. I mean, one could draw reference to uh, a time when it was believed that we are beyond history, right? So the only possible way would be the Western. I I, maybe uh, in the um, just thinking about the road signs as well. Um, perhaps one way, one way thinking might be the uh, the way to because <laughs> you have. Yes. Uh... <laughs> echo of Walter Benjamin there. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's whatever is not uh, pluralistic or acknowledges differences again. Mm -hmm. Back to that term, difference. Also, uh, homologizing maybe the sense that uh, everything is homogeneous. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yes. Which points to another keyword, which is globalization. So <laughs> I think you would have fun yeah. uh, looking for traces of that in, in many of the keywords. Um, but it's definitely something that Vatimo was very concerned in terms of how the current discourse has been reduced, right? To just one way of accepting right. acceptable way to think. Which is which is just to follow up, which is a way of saying that Vatimo will add, well, our greatest problem now is that we don't have enough conflict, right? We don't have enough, we don't really have a real conflict. That's why most analytic philosophers, they don't really have big discussions among each other. It's sort of a dialogue. It's not a real conversation. And the problem is that we don't have enough conflict, in other words. And if you look at well, where you are, the Republican Party and Democrats, basically the same thing. Here also, it happens the whole the same. It's basically the same. So even from a political point of view, there is not enough conflict. There is, and by conflict, I'm, I mean conflict at least within democratic institutions. Uh, but there isn't anymore, and that's probably one of the. That's why. That's one of the things. One of the reasons why Vatimo always insisted that la globalizzazione è una presa in giro. Globalization is basically they are they make joking with you. It's it, it's a farce. It's, it's useless. It's it's a way of of making sure that there isn't any conflict anymore. Of course, by not being there any conflict, there is a much greater conflict than the one we are. Um, we're experiencing now. The fact that we are talking in, in English is already an indication of that. Right? Not that it's wrong, and but um, the fact that if you publish your PhD, the ones that are finishing now off, if you publish it in English, you would have much higher chances than of getting a job than if you publish it in German, for example. And this, unfortunately, today also works for German scholars in Germany. So. Um, that's what globalization also means. For Batimo, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, point of uh, uh, specification. Thank you so much. Um, I think we should. Uh, uh, okay, I have a request to spell it. How, how about I type it in? Huh? Pensiero unico. I'm very bad at spelling. Um, and uh, also thanks from Ashley Woodward, another contributor to the dictionary. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and thanks everybody for uh, being with us for uh, this long. It's been a real pleasure to introduce you to some uh, salient aspects of this dictionary. Uh, I hope you will find it uh, stimulating, enlightening, and uh, hopefully uh, creative at the same time. So, thank you, David, Silvia, Santiago. Great pleasure to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Really, what a pleasure. Have a great day. <laughs>